What does the Gospel of John have to do with Stranger Things? So I forgot at the beginning, Abby and I have been watching Stranger Things. That feels like a very abrupt change. <laughs> but we have. We've been very slowly watching Stranger Things on Netflix. And uh, a few months ago, we were watching season two with my brother, who has seen it before. And he said, hey, don't watch the next episode. If you've seen it, you'll maybe know the one he's talking about. It is a waste of time. The writers basically forget that it was there. They kind of just ignore it in the future. You don't need to watch episode seven to, to know what episode eight is talking about. He was begging us, and we ignored him. We watched it, and we made a mistake. We shouldn't have watched it. But the word of God, I'm going somewhere, is not like Stranger Things. <laughs> the word of God has no dud episodes. You don't watch one scene in John's gospel. You don't walk through John's gospel, come to a scene, and then think, ah, I didn't need to read that passage. As John goes, he is layering and building scene by scene towards a crescendo. We watch TV shows and we go, ah, the writers realized that was a, a dud plot line and they moved on. The Holy Spirit never wastes his breath. Every word in John's gospel so far has been building and layering. And I say that because if you have missed out some of what John is doing, then this morning's passage might seem a bit confusing. It might seem a bit kind of back and forth and a bit of a dud episode, really. Uh, John chapter 7, which we're in this morning, it kind of relies on our having paid careful attention over the last six chapters. John is kind of pulling on some threads. He set up this big idea in his prologue, and he's been teasing it out, and, and now we're going to see more of that teased out. In particular, John is going to begin to kind of draw into conflict two types of people this morning. What we'll see kind of pulled out as we go is that Jesus is hidden in plain sight because of our misplaced priorities, because of our religious sensibilities, and most of all because of our sin that blinds us to the goodness of God. But if you've been paying attention to John, what we'll notice subtly as we go is that Jesus has his priorities right. That Jesus comes from the Father and displaces our religious sensibilities, and that Jesus reveals the Father to us, and he opens our eyes that have been blinded by sin. And all of that relies on us having seen that picture of Jesus that's already been set up throughout John. But this morning we are in John chapter 7. I just wanted to flag that before we read the passage so that as we go you might be kind of have your ears pricked to hear what is it that John is pulling on here. So Reuben, I'm going to ask uh, you to come up and read. Okay, well, as I said, this is a kind of back and forward text, isn't it? It's a bit like a ping pong match. Hard to follow who's saying what. But just to lay the cards on the table, I want us to operate from this assumption. Uh, what we see in John 7 is a kind of lived out example of John's claim in the prologue. It should come up on the screen behind me, verses 9 to 11 of John 1. John writes this, he says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. This text is a kind of proof of John's claim. And we begin to ask questions, why did his own not receive him? Why could they not recognize him? Why is it that those who walked on the very ground as God did, why is it that they were blinded to his glory? And then how exactly can we receive him? How can we be the type of person who recognizes him? We see a few explanations as John kind of layers his gospel story this morning. First, we see Jesus is hidden by misplaced priorities. Chapter begins with a, a kind of brief note that Jesus chose to go about in Galilee. The temperature has been turned up in Judea on Jesus. What we've seen last week as Ian was preaching is that the crowds, all of the kind of religious crowds and authorities in Judea, they begin just to turn away from Jesus and abandon him. 
And Jesus asked the disciples that fateful question, are you going to leave me too? Peter says, Lord, where else should we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so Jesus kind of retreats to Galilee. He kind of moves away from the temperature that's rising on him. And what's interesting is if you kind of compare the dates of the two festivals that John mentions in John 6 and now in John 7, this going about in Galilee is about six months. One verse, John just says, oh, then Jesus went about in Galilee. Six months. Some commentators think the six months holds most of the stories that we read in the Synoptic Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So most of the kind of Galilean ministry of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, healing the sick, casting out demons, is found in this phrase, then Jesus went about in Galilee. It's not strange that John would just cast that away. Well, it's because for John's purposes, he really just wants us to zoom in on this tension that's growing between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. We're kind of beginning to crescendo towards Holy Week where Jesus is arrested and crucified. And so John is just starting to bring these things together. We don't need to read about the Sermon on the Mount and the story. We need to read about the Jewish leaders. We need to read about what is happening for Jesus to get to the point of his crucifixion. So all that to say, Jesus isn't hiding in Galilee. He's not afraid. He's not kind of back in his mum's house waiting for the pressure to pass so he can start again. Jesus is doing ministry in Galilee and we skip over it. He's kind of hiding in plain sight in our text. Six months and then the action continues. Jesus' brothers tell him, hey, there's a great festival happening in Jerusalem. They say, go to Judea so that your disciples there might see the works that you do. No one, they say, who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. In Greek, they literally say, nobody who does things in secret can also do things boldly. They have a kind of one or the other view of who Jesus can be. But from our perspective, their logic seems sound. They're basically saying, if you are the Son of God, why are you hiding out here in backwater Galilee? All of the main people that you need to impress, all of the hotshots, are in Jerusalem for this festival. In fact, we might imagine them using Jesus' own words from the Sermon on the Mount against him. Nobody puts a lamp under a basket. Let your light shine before men so that they might see your works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I don't know about you, but I kind of find myself on the side of Jesus' brothers. What an opportunity, Jesus. What are you doing? I find myself, if I'm honest, if I'm reflecting this week on this text, I find myself with misplaced priorities. Because John makes it clear in verse 5 that the reason Jesus' brothers say these things is because they don't yet believe in him. For his brothers, Jesus is wasting his potential. They've seen him cast out demons and heal the sick. They've seen him say some things that blow the minds of those listening. And they think, why are you not winning the affection of the world? Why are you not out there wooing people and gaining a following? Why aren't you cozying up to the politicians and religious elites? Don't you want them to like you? Don't you want fame? Don't you want glory, Jesus? As Christians, we find ourselves caught up in these temptations too. We can understand his brother's frustration. What are you doing? You're wasting your time. But Jesus hits back. And here's the first time that our John reading ears should kind of prick up. In verse 6, Jesus says, My time is not yet here. For you, any time will do. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. See that rich theme of the world that John has been beginning to kind of pepper through his gospel? It's kind of picked up here again. For John, the world doesn't just mean this planet. 
It means the system of thoughts and values and social norms and practices that mark a culture that has redefined good and evil away from the Word of God. So to be blunt, much of what we would call culture, the Bible would call the world. The earliest Christians didn't kind of say, well, there's the kind of, there's the kind of um, Roman culture here, and then we have our own culture. No, they were clear. That is the world. It's the system of thoughts and practices and beliefs that mark a redefinition of good and evil away from the Word of God. And Jesus really wants his brothers to know something. God and the world are at odds. The way of Jesus, the way that he is beginning to live his life, and the way of the world are going in two completely separate trajectories. And Jesus' brothers are kind of trying to straddle the two and draw them together. They say, yeah, but we see your miracles, but don't you want some of this, Jesus? Don't you want some of the fame? If Jesus closes up to the world, he's saying, if he just gets a bit too comfortable, then he will have disregarded the will of his Father. Isn't it interesting that Jesus says to his brothers, my time hasn't come, but for you, the time is always right. What do you mean by that? It means that he himself, Jesus, he operates off of the kind of timetable of heaven. He operates from the kind of principle in Ecclesiastes. There is a time for everything, but there is a time for it. The time isn't always now. Jesus waits for his father to say go. He isn't chomping at the bit. For Jesus, his motto isn't seize the day. It's today is the day the Lord has made. What is the Father's will today? For us, we say, how am I going to squeeze every drop of goodness out of this day? How am I going to achieve this? How am I going to improve my fitness and my career and my... You could go on. We try and squeeze the marrow from the bone of each day. Jesus says, no, my time hasn't come. Father hasn't said go. You go. The time is always right for you. Why? Because the world cannot hate you. Jesus' brothers have not left the world. They don't believe in him. They're bound to their own desires. A kind of do what you want when you want attitude is not the way of Jesus. Jesus has his priorities straight. He has a kind of allegiance to his father's timetable, a willingness to stay in obscurity, a refusal to suck up to the powers that be. Jesus models perfect submission to God. And it costs him here, doesn't it? If he has a desire like I think I would if I was him, to be famous, to be well thought of, to not be too offensive, then he is missing an opportunity his brothers are blinded to his glory because they have misplaced priorities. Jesus doesn't look impressive. I wonder if you feel the same. Maybe Jesus this morning is hidden before your eyes because he just doesn't look all that impressive. Maybe you think every Christian I know seems to just be using him as a crutch. They seem to be quite weak. They seem to know that they need help, and I don't want to be someone that needs help. Jesus doesn't look all that impressive. I'll grant you that. Our Savior is a carpenter come rabbi from first century Palestine. It doesn't look impressive. And Jesus' brothers can't get over that problem. Maybe you're here and you are struggling with the Reality that to follow Jesus means you can't follow the ways of the world. Maybe you're kind of doing that thing where you're trying to grab on both sides and pull them together. Whatever it is, Jesus is so often hidden by our misplaced priorities, by our desire for sex and money and power that outstrips our desire for him. And the problem isn't that you want things too much, it's that you don't grasp that Jesus is the one who fulfills your desires. His brothers can't see it. He isn't who they want him to be and they miss him. 
It's their misplaced priorities. But Jesus is also hidden by religious sensibilities. Jesus does go to the festival on his father's time, and he begins to teach. And we'll come back to that in just a moment, but look with me at your Bibles to verse 25. The masses kind of start to debate, who is this guy? Is he actually the Messiah? Why are they trying to arrest him? We don't understand what's going on. And they come to a conclusion in verse 27. They say this, we say, we know where this man is from. He's from Nazareth. But when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Implication, he can't be the Messiah because he's not what we thought he would be. The kind of religious sensibilities of this crowd blind them to Jesus' glory. In Jeremiah 31, God, through his prophet, he laments that Israel can receive teaching from one another instead of from him. Their knowledge about God comes more from kind of coffee shop gossip than it does from his word. Crowds seem to say, look, we know. We know what the Messiah will be like when he comes because we've discussed it among ourselves and we've kind of put our heads together and we've done the sums and we know the Messiah will be like this. And this guy's not like this. And two plus two equals four, so he cannot be the Messiah. Cannot be the Messiah. So often we are like them. We rely on secondary sources. Instead of coming to the Word of God, instead of allowing God to teach us what He is like. Something for you to consider. Does your knowledge of God increase primarily through the primary source or the secondary? Do you know what you know of him mostly because your parents told you it? Because you heard it in a sermon once, you heard it at a conference once, because somebody worded something in a way that you enjoyed and you clung to it. Not that those things are wrong. But the kind of prophetic force of Jeremiah 31 calls us to say the very words of God need to be where we look for wisdom. We need to look to what God has said about himself. Not, well, we know that God is like this. And in God's word, he says he's like this, but we know. So there must be something. We must just be misunderstanding the Bible. We have to come first to the text. We have to come first to the very written word of God and allow it to teach us. We just submit to what God has said about himself. In the case of these crowds, they are so caught up in their ideas of what God should be like that truth himself stands in front of them. The author of the word of God opens the word of God and begins to teach and they say, I oh, know he's, he, he's missed it. He's not the Messiah. Let's look at that um, teaching. Can I borrow your Bible? On? Let's look at that uh, teaching that Jesus does in uh, verses 14 It's 20. Jesus comes to the festival. And it says in verse 14, Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, How did this man get such learning without having been taught? Well, Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who speaks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not any one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? The teaching of Jesus apparently is so profound so powerful, so nothing like what people have heard before, that they start to whisper, where on earth did these guys get, this guy get these ideas? Did you have a PhD, Jesus? Did you teach yourself these things? What rabbi did you learn under? How on earth did you become so wise? And Jesus' answer to begin isn't all that abnormal. He says, my teaching is not my own. 
And every rabbi would want to say something like that. Every rabbi would want to kind of substantiate their teaching. If I stood up here today and said, guys, I'm making all this up. Nobody taught me this. God didn't say this. I'm just making it up. You would be like, well, this isn't really worth my time. There's no world in which a rabbi stands up and says, this teaching is my own. Most rabbis would have kind of apprenticed under another rabbi who apprenticed under another rabbi and so on, and they would stand in a line of teaching that would earmark them as worth listening to. So the crowds essentially are asking Jesus to pull out his CV. Which rabbi taught you and which rabbi taught them? What stream of teaching is this from? What is abnormal is that Jesus hasn't apprenticed under anyone. So his teaching is not his own, but nobody taught him. He hasn't kind of taken the teachings of another rabbi and added his spin. Instead, he makes a bold claim. His words come directly from the one who sent him, from God. See, the Son of God with flesh on, he doesn't make anything up according to his human nature. He doesn't just start to kind of spin a web. Like he just relays what he has seen and what he has heard in eternity. Jesus isn't in the lineage of any elite rabbi. He has a direct line with the Father himself. He comes from God. We saw earlier that God kind of lamented in Jeremiah 31 that God's people taught each other. What we didn't see was the note of hope in that prophecy. Jeremiah 31, verses 33 and 34 says this, This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Here is Jesus, God in the flesh. And he fulfilled God's promise that one day God himself will teach his people. That they won't need to kind of gossip and whisper and figure it out. But he will speak directly to them. Not in secret, not obscurely, but clearly. And so that is a huge claim that Jesus has made. And we see this because look at the crowd's response in verse 20. You are demon possessed. Seems like an overreaction to us in our day. The only logical explanation is the crowd actually understand what he's teaching. They've got it. They've picked it up. They're not wrong. He's claiming to be God. This rabbi who has just journeyed to Jerusalem from Galilee is claiming to be Yahweh. He's teaching as though he has all the authority in the world. So he must be demon-possessed. Because these are the only options. Either he's a lunatic and he's clearly not because his teaching is wise. Or he's demon-possessed or he's telling the truth. And so the crowds revolt. You're demon-possessed. If he is actually the Messiah, they must be thinking, we need to submit to him. We need to listen to him. We need to allow who he is to change what we thought he would be. And the hardness of the human heart is the last thing they want to do. And so he must be demon-possessed. There's no other way. To submit to him is the last thing they want to do. He's not the Messiah they want, and so he's not the Messiah at all. When I was a, an atheist teenager, I was uh, very edgy about it all, and uh, my laptop wallpaper <laughs> used to be this like image of a globe and next to it it said in the beginning man made God in his own image. I used to kind of look at it and think yeah that's right religious idiots they made God in their own image. It's supposed to be a dig at the kind of claims of faith. In reality it was completely true. That is the human condition we make God in our own image. That's the problem that the Bible identifies right in the beginning, we make our own minds up on who God is and then we worship that God. 
And even when the true God stands in front of us, we continue to worship the God we've made in our own image. We choose our kind of preconceived ideas over the truth that's revealed to us. We make God in our own image. This problem is deep in the human heart. The Apostle Paul uh, writes to Timothy. <clears throat> he warns him. He says, man, people are going to begin to accumulate teachers to scratch their itching ears. You see that now, don't you? I want someone who teaches me this certain thing about the Word of God. I'll just Google it and find a teacher. I'll find a rabbi. I'll find someone who will give me the God that I want. We have an insatiable appetite for lies. Dallas Willard, one of my favorite authors, he writes this. He says, strangely, we seem prepared to learn to live from almost anyone but Jesus. Where we spontaneously look for information on how to live shows how we truly feel and who we really have confidence in. Here's the kind of ground zero relevance of this passage. The religious crowd had more confidence in themselves than in Jesus. We have more confidence in podcasters, influencers, and talk show hosts than we do Jesus. We are what Paul warned about. We have etching ears. We accumulate teachers for ourselves. We follow people on social media that will teach us what we want to hear. We have etching ears. By our stubborn, quasi-religious sensibilities, we hide Jesus in plain sight. We gather teachers, and then when Jesus doesn't meet our ideas of right and wrong, we deconstruct our faith instead of our false beliefs. Nowhere is this more seriously pressing today than the issue of sexuality and personal freedom. Many of us think, if Jesus doesn't line up exactly with my 21st century ideals of sexual freedom, consent as the only basis for sexual ethics, a kind of fluid gender identity. It must be him that needs to change. It must be him, because I know what is right. But the crowd say, we know the Messiah won't be like this. I know, Lord, I know what's good for me. I know it must be you that needs to change. It must be the Word of God that needs to change. It must be on me to bring Jesus into the present day. It must be on me to find some weird loophole in the Bible where I can say oh, he didn't really mean what he said. Let me just be clear. If you disagree with Jesus on something, you're wrong. He comes from God. You come from Glasgow. <laughs> like, who, who stands before the God of the universe and says, yeah, but Lord, my friendship group in, you know, you know Glasgow Uni, you know how, like, we're really smart, but we figured it out. So God, just let me be. That's insane. It's insane. I'm sorry. God is God. You must submit to him. Change your opinion to come into line with the opinion of Jesus. Drag Jesus into your lives. Profane the name of Jesus by twisting his word to say what you want it to say. Don't make me get too harsh on you, but the Bible does not speak pleasantly about people that twist and add to the word of God. Jesus' words, as Peter said, are the words of eternal life. Yours are not. We know this isn't what the Messiah is really like. That is a tragic statement. That is a tragic statement. Jesus stands in front of them and they hide him. They put their blindfold on. He's hidden by the religious sensibilities. Misplaced priorities, religious sensibilities, 
and now most seriously, Jesus is hidden in plain sight because of their blinding sin. John makes this claim with shocking boldness, really, in chapter 3. Verse 19, he said, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Why don't we recognize Jesus? Why do we have such a significant bent towards lies? Why is it so hard to see him for who he is? John gives us it clearly because our deeds are evil. In other words, because sin blinds us to reality. We see that in the story. Notice in verse 19 how Jesus kind of explains their inability to know whether he is trustworthy. Verse 19, has not Moses given you the law, yet not one of you keeps it? Why are you trying to kill me? And then before that, he says, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God. What's his implication? Well, you're not doing the will of God. You've chosen not to do the will of God, and so you can't see me. There's a kind of reason debate going on, and Jesus just interrupts and says, no, 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 this isn't the problem. Let me call you out on your sin. That's really what's going on here. See, in the mind of Jesus, unbelief's not this kind of morally neutral territory. He doesn't think that we are born in the middle of the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. And that if we say, well, Lord, I'm just exploring. I'm not sure. To Jesus, that is not a neutral statement. Unbelief is not neutral. It is willful ignorance of the glory of God. Let me warn you, some of the teachings of the Bible and this stuff, they rub against us. I'll read you what the Apostle Paul says about this. Romans 1, beginning in verse 18. He says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what could be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Do you understand what he's saying? Unbelief is not about evidence. We don't lack evidence. By nature, the Bible says, we can see what is clearly true about God. The issue is sin, not evidence. We have made the decision deep in our hearts to suppress reality. We've chosen, you don't remember choosing, but you've chosen to suppress the truth in wickedness. That's what the Apostle Paul says. Paul writes elsewhere, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, the God of this age, that's Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Again, it's not morally neutral. It's not a kind of in-between position. By nature, we are blinded by sin and Satan. Let me be straight. Again, some of you won't like this. If you're a non-believer, evidence is not, has never been, and will never be your issue. The people in this story saw a man raise someone from the dead. They saw a man heal and cast out demons. They saw a man rise from the dead after hanging on a cross, and they didn't believe can't have more evidence than that. You can't. Evidence is not the issue. If you are waiting for enough evidence before you believe, you will never have enough to satisfy your heart. Not because it's not there, because sin has blinded us to reality. Because sin is our deepest abiding issue, not evidence. We know there is a God. We know he has made a claim on our lives. We know that we are not at peace with him. We know that. Sociologist Charles Taylor calls all of this the hauntedness of a secular age. We are haunted 
by a reality that goes beyond our mundane day-to-day lives. We are haunted by the reality of the God of this universe. We know there's something more. Evidence is not our issue. It's not the religious crowd's issue. It's not anyone's issue. The issue is that each of us, apart from God, is in a dire predicament. We cannot see. We are blind. We are captured by sin. That's what the Bible teaches about unbelief. And Jesus spells out the harrowing reality of this. Verse 28 of our passage. He says to the Kurds, yeah, you you know me and you know where I am from. I'm not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him. But I know him because I am from him and he sent me. Then verse 33, I'm with you for a short time and then I'm going back to the one who sent me. You'll look for me, but you won't find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Jesus lays down the gauntlet. You cannot know God. You cannot come with me to be with God. Earlier on, it's the same vein. The world cannot hate you. Why? Because the way of the world and the way of Jesus are going in two very separate directions. Where I am going, you cannot come. Next week, Ian is going to pick up in verse 37. And this story takes a sudden jump. The next day, Jesus kind of stands up on a table and he says, Come to me, all you who are thirsty, and drink. But for now, all we hear Jesus say is, you cannot come. You can't come. You cannot come where I'm going. The picture seems confusing and dark for now. And this is where we need to make sure we've been listening to John. Because verse 30, we catch just a glimpse of light. We're kind of trapped in this dark, damp shed, and suddenly a shaft of light pokes through. Look at verse 30. The crowds are outraged. It says, at this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Still, many in the crowd believed in him. Here's the first piece of good news this morning. Just lift. I know that was heavy. Here's the first piece of good news. By the mercy of God, our blinded hearts can respond in faith. Not mockery, not derision, but faith to the words of Jesus. Uh, Taylor Whitman, he wrote a book called Biblical Reasoning. He writes this. He said, the effect of God's disruptive word is to separate its possible recipients into three categories which Paul depicts as offense and unbelief, disputing and mocking, or astonishment and wonder. He goes on, were it not for God's grace, all would belong to one of the first two groups. That's what we see in our text. Some people mock, some people disbelieve, some people try and arrest Jesus, but some believe. A little comment John throws in. Yet some believed in him. Some have their eyes opened for the first time to the reality that Jesus is Lord. Which of those three are you this morning? Are you offended at the words of the Bible? Are you someone who mocks in disbelief How could you believe such nonsense? Or do you, despite everything, find yourself this morning in astonishment and wonder that Jesus is Lord? That's not neutral. That's not just a decision you made. It's miraculous. If you believe that Jesus is Lord, it is a gift that you owe fully to God himself. Remember last week, Peter's confession that Jesus had the words of eternal life? Do you think he figured that out himself? 
Well, in Matthew 16, uh, we see another of Peter's confessions. He says, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus says this. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. To hear the teaching of Jesus and not mock and not be confused and not have a hardened heart, but to respond in faith is nothing less than a miracle. It's the greatest of all miracles. Jesus raised the dead and nothing compares to the way he raises a dead, stony heart to believe in Jesus. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, you are saved by grace through faith and this is the gift of God. I mean, that gift of faith is in place. We find our eyes open to the reality of who Jesus is and what he does. In the words of St. Augustine, it says, understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand so that you might believe, but believe that you might understand. In other words, you don't climb the hill to knowing God by our own clever ideas. We're not like these religious crowds. We don't gather here on a Sunday morning to put our heads together and just figure out the next puzzle piece in climbing to God. We don't come here to try and do enough good to get closer to Him. And we receive Him by faith and then the scales begin to fall from our eyes. It means the good news this morning is that you can go forward as a Christian, trusting God, believing in Jesus. You don't have to get your priorities straight first. You don't have to get all of your mangled up ideas about who God is and how he fits into your life straight before you take the step of following him. You don't need to get your sin dealt with. You don't need to live a good life before you come to him. We come in faith. The people who believed were the people who were questioning. This isn't a separate group, a kind of more elite, more religious, more clued in group. This is people from the crowd who were confused. We believe. We believe. Come in faith, and that faith is an instrument in God's hands. So that one day after another, our eyes open further and further to see the glory of God. Second piece of good news. John won't let us believe that in the abstract. The Pharisees try to arrest Jesus and they can't even touch him. Why? Here's our second piece of good news. Because his hour had not yet come. You know how John uses this word. The hour of Jesus is always the hour of his death. Every time John uses the word hour, it refers to that. It is as though John wants to just divert our attention now. We can acknowledge together, I'll acknowledge to you, I have misplaced priorities. So do you. I seek fame and wealth and popularity. Sometimes I'm tempted to use my faith as a means to an end. Sometimes I don't listen to the timetable of God and I just try and do things my own way. I have misplaced priorities. And I have religious sensibilities. I think I know God. Sometimes the word of God shocks me and confess I don't always find it easy to believe him. Sometimes I have religious sensibilities, so do you. You have ideas about God that are not in line with the Bible, so do I. I have sin that blinds me to reality. I can be impatient. Frustration boils up in me much more than I want it to. I look at my life and think, Lord, I'm not who I want to be. If you don't think that, um, I know there's sin in your life that's blinding you to the reality of who God is. And all of that this morning could, could capture our attention. 
We could kind of get bogged down here. But Lord, my priorities and my sin and my sensibilities, and well, I'm just, I'm a mess. But John doesn't want our attention fixed down here. He wants our eyes to turn to the cross. The Puritans called it the burning, fiery center of the glory of God. So that when you look at it, the image of God, the glory of God is burned into your eyes that you cannot stop seeing him. The crucified Christ, and we're going to see him in all his splendor in John's gospel, is the clearest picture of the glory of God there has ever been. Oh Lord, I can't see you because I'm, i just got my priorities all mangled and I just, I can't figure out your word and I can't stop sinning. And I can't see you through all this nonsense. Jesus says, lift your eyes. Look to the cross. Look to the fiery burning glory of God as the Son of Man hangs up to die. And it is at that cross, as we come with our hands kind of stuffed full of all this stuff, all this kind of heavy, weighty stuff that stops us from seeing him. It's as we come to the cross and we drop it at the cross. It's there, it's only in that place that our blind eyes are opened, that our stubborn hearts are softened, that our blinding sin is placed on Jesus and crucified eternally. Next week, we're going to see Jesus call out, come to me. Good news this morning is we don't need to wait until next week to do that. By nature, you cannot come. You cannot come to him. You cannot go where he's going. But by grace, through faith alone, you can be counted among the number in this story who believed. Who believed. Even if you're a Christian, who go forward in renewed faith saying, Lord, I may have my priorities messed up, I may have my ideas all messed up, and I may have sin that I just can't get rid of, but thank you, Jesus. All it takes is faith. All it takes is faith. I go forward in faith, Lord, one day at a time. Open my eyes, Lord, please. John starts his gospel with some of these words. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Why? Because of the world's misplaced priorities, because of the world's religious sensibilities, because of the world's blinding sin. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. It's kind of eerie, quiet at this moment in the text. He came to his own and even his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I pray that that's you this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we lift our eyes. We lift our eyes to Jesus, who is the truth of God. We confess, without you, Jesus, we would have no idea about who God is. We would be trapped in our sin. We'd be blind. But Jesus, you are the one who reveals God to us. You came from him, and you returned to him, and by your grace, we can go where you have gone. We confess together, Lord, maybe for the first time. We confess together those words of Peter. You, Jesus, have the words of eternal life. We have faith in you, Jesus. Would you rearrange our priorities, Lord? Would you bring our thoughts that come from ourselves into align with what you have said about yourself. And Father, for those of us who are 
following Jesus, but trapped in sin. Lord, we pray for that reminder, that that glory of God on the cross, that our sin was crucified with Christ. Would that become very real to us again this morning? Would we go forward not in a kind of drudgery and feeling like we're never going to beat our sin, but Lord, would we lift our eyes again to the cross, to the Son of Man, dying in our place? We thank you our sin is dealt with. Lord, if our sin hasn't been dealt with, pray for our friends here, Lord, that have not given their life to Jesus, have not had their sin dealt with, have not had their eyes opened. Lord, would this be the day? Thank you, Lord, your word says today is the day of salvation. Pray, if there's anyone in this room, Lord, who, are, who is unsure, who is, who is wrestling in their spirit about whether to follow Jesus, Lord, I pray that in your kindness, you would draw near, you would reveal yourself to them, you would reveal that you love them, that you know them intimately, and that you die, Jesus, so that they might be restored to their original purpose, to walk with you, to know you as their father and their friend. Lord, come and bring life this morning. Come and renew the life that's already in us. Where else would we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. We love you and we worship you. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen.